visitors. It's good to have you all with us. And we welcome those who are tuning in on our various digital means of getting the Word of God out to those who choose to listen and watch. Uh, what a privilege it is to be able to reach out into your homes, your cars, wherever you choose to uh, listen to us. Uh, we are in a new year, 2020. And to start this new year off, our speaker this morning is Bill Kearns. Bill? Good morning. Let's just begin with a word of prayer. Our God and Father, we do thank you and we praise you for your kindness and your goodness. Father, we look forward to what you have planned for us in this upcoming year. We know that what that is will be good for us and will bring glory to you. And that, Father, is exactly what we desire. We desire that, that we would bring glory to the very God of the universe. So we pray for your help. We pray, Father, this morning that you would open your word to us, that you would show us the things wherein we lack, that we would have hearts that are burdened to follow your will and your way, that we would be better servants, that we would be more like the person of the Lord Jesus Christ, that others might look at us and see him. And so, Father, again, we would just pray for your help, for your instruction, and for your guidance, and we'll give you the glory. So it's in Christ's name that we pray. Amen. Well, last week we actually had our New Year's message. So today is not a New Year's message, but it kind of is. It's uh, talking about something that I like to talk about, and many of you have heard me talk about it before. I'm going to talk a little bit about time and how that fits into the plan of God. And the title of the message this morning is His Hour. His Hour. But I'd like for you first to turn with me to the 90th Psalm, please. The 90th Psalm, Psalm 90. And this was written by Moses. Psalm 90, beginning at verse 1. Lord, thou hast been our dwelling place in all generations. Before the mountains were brought forth, or ever thou hadst formed the earth and the world, even from everlasting to everlasting, thou art God. Thou turnest man to destruction, and sayest, Return, ye children of men. For a thousand years in thy sight are but as yesterday when it is past, and as a watch in the night. Thou carriest them away as with a flood. They are like a sleep. In the morning they are like grass which groweth up. In the morning it flourisheth and groweth up, and in the evening it is cut down and withereth. For we are consumed by thine anger, and by thy wrath are we troubled. Thou hast set our iniquities before thee, our secret sins in the light of thy countenance. For all our days are passed away in thy wrath. We spend our years as a tale that is told. The days of our years are threescore years and ten. And if by reason of strength they be fourscore years, yet is their strength labor and sorrow, for it is soon cut off and we fly away. Who knoweth the power of thine anger? Even according to thy fear, so is thy wrath. So teach us to number our days, that we may apply our hearts into wisdom. Return, O Lord. How long? Let it Repent thee concerning thy servants. <coughs> o satisfy us early with thy mercy, that we may rejoice and be glad all of our days. Make us glad according to the days wherein thou hast afflicted us, and the years wherein we have seen evil. Let thy work appear unto thy servants, and thy glory unto their children. And let the beauty of the Lord our God be upon us, and establish thou our work of our hands upon us. Yea, the work of our hands establish thou it. That's quite a psalm, isn't it? And it deals, as you can see, with time and the Lord's use of time and the Lord's uh, use of judgment and recompense. 
And Moses says, you know what? It's all good. It's all good. Teach us to number our days that we would apply our hearts to and the wisdom. Return, turn, O Lord, and let it repent thee concerning thy servants. O satisfy us early with thy mercy that we may rejoice and be glad all of our days. Look at verse 15. Make us glad according to the days wherein thou hast blessed us. Is that what it says? Afflicted us. And the years whereon we have seen evil. If the Lord allows these things in our hearts, or in our lives rather, we should know in our hearts it's all for good. And so we're going to talk a little bit about time. We're going to talk a little bit about the potentate of time. Now, you've heard me use that expression before, and we're going to be using it today. And I hope by the time that we're finished, you all have an appreciation for God's dealing in time. After all, a new year is upon us. Amen? Amen. Time. His hour was come. Let's turn over to John chapter 13. John chapter 13, verse 1. And listen for that phrase. His hour was come. Now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour was come, that he should depart out of this world unto the Father... Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them unto the end. He loved them unto the end. Let's start this morning by saying this. We are creatures of time. Every one of us are creatures of time. The way we conduct our lives revolves around time. We can't get away from time. Time marches on. Time passes on. We cannot live outside of time. And you know what? There never seems to be enough of it, does there? And the world makes more and more demands on us each and every day so that there seems like there's less and less time. You all know that I retired here recently, just a few months ago, and thought I would have lots of time. Beverly says I have too much time on my hands, but the way I feel about it is that there's just not enough time. There's not enough time to do the things she wants me to do. There's certainly not enough time to, to do the things that I would like to do, and there's never enough time to rest. So, you know, we just don't, we don't have enough time. And, and society really, and you all know this, really makes demands on our time. When I was working, my heart rate at rest with medication was 120. 120. After I retired, and since I have retired, my heart rate at rest is 75. What caused that? stress. What caused that? Not enough time. Not enough time. Too many demands on my time. And each of you know what I'm talking about, whether it's your job, whether it's at school, whether it's with family. Society makes demands on our time, don't they? And part of the problem is that we tend to handle time very care, uh, carelessly. I do. I have to admit it, I confess it. First of all, the lady sitting in the second row over there would tell you that I am the world's worst procrastinator. Never do today what you can put off until tomorrow. And I do that a lot. And so I'm my own worst enemy in some ways. And I always say, well, I work better under pressure. But I'm not so sure that that's true. But we handle it very careless, carelessly. For instance, society and mankind as a whole does the same thing. When we talk about a day, we talk about a day consisting of what? 24 hours. Did you know that that's not true? What? 
A day doesn't consist of 24 hours. One revolution of the earth consists of 23 hours, 56 minutes, and 4.0916 seconds. Not 24 hours. Now, if you young men, when you go to college, whip that out on a college professor, he'll go, hmm, this young man knows what he's talking about. <laughs> and when you're dating and you put your arm around your girl and you look deep into her eyes and you lay that on her <laughs> and you say, and what I could do with those remaining three minutes and 56 seconds in every day when I'm with you. I guarantee you, you'll win her heart. No problems. So just write that down and be sure and use that. But seriously, the 90th Psalm and the prayer of Moses tells us the days of our years are three score and ten. Did you catch that when we were reading it? Which means the average lifetime is what? Seventy years. Seventy years. And the truth of the matter is that it should put our lifespan, our lifetime, into perspective. We're only going to live to be, on average, about 70 years. Now, I'm going to be 66 here in just a month or two or three or four or five or seven. <laughs> the point, point being, I'm not far away from that date. Some of you are past it. If we were to put our, our ages on a, a 24-hour perspective, and I'm going back to the 24-hour day, at age 20, the time would be 6.52 a.m. Still got some time. At 30, it would be 10.17 a.m. At 40, 1.42 p.m. At 50, 5.08 p.m. At 60, 8.34 p.m. At 65, 10.17 p.m. And at 70, the toll of death. Anything past 70, you're living on what we call borrowed time. You're living on borrowed time. But truth be told, whether we're young or old, we are all living on borrowed time because nothing is assured for us past the breath that we take. Nothing. Turn over to James, if you will. James sets us straight, and he sets us straight in a way that should speak to us. James 4, look at verse 13. He says, Come now, ye that say, Today or tomorrow we will go into such a city, and continue there a year, and buy and sell and get gain, whereas you know not what shall be on the next day. For what is your life? It is even as a vapor that appeareth for a little time, and then vanisheth away. It's just like the morning mist. It's there, and then the next thing you know, you look and it's what? It's gone. Or it's just like a vapor of smoke, a wisp of smoke that you can see, and then it's gone. That's life. And we can't count on the next day, let alone the next year. So what should we do with our time? How should we make use of our time? Well, that's what we're going to discuss this morning. Let's go back to John just for a second, chapter 13 and verse, verse 1. And let's reread that. Now, before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour was come, that he should depart out of this world unto the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them unto the end. Did you notice that little phrase, his hour? Did you notice what it didn't say? It didn't say that hour, when Jesus knew that hour was come, or the hour was come. It very particularly says he knew when what? His hour 
was coming. What does that that uh, personal pronoun there tell us? That the hour belonged to who? To him. He owned the hour. You want to know why he owned the hour? Because he's the potentate of time. He's the creator God of the universe. That particular phrase, his hour, is only used three times in the scripture. All three times are in the book of John. First time is in John chapter 7, verse 30. Second time in John chapter 8 and verse 20. And here. And all three times, it speaks about that hour belonging to the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. I would emphatically submit to you that all time, are you listening? That all time belongs to the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the creator of time and it belongs to Him. Another way of expressing this truth is to say that Christ is the potentate of time. That is, He is the sovereign, autocratic ruler of time. Can I repeat that? He is the sovereign, autocratic ruler of time. And I'm not making that statement on my own. I'd like to say that I thought it up, but I didn't. As a matter of fact, the scripture tells us that. Let's turn over to 1 Timothy chapter 6. And the first thing I'd like to read is verse 11, and then we'll skip a few verses. But let's read verse 11 first because this is a commandment that's being given. But thou, O man of God, and this is Paul speaking to his, his son in the faith, Timothy. But thou, O man of God, flee these things and follow after righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, meekness. Fight the good fight of faith, lay hold on eternal life unto which thou art called and hast possessed a good profession before many witnesses. That's the command. Now go over to verse 14. Paul says that thou keep this commandment without spot, unrebukable unto the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 15, listen to this, which in his times, whose times? The Lord Jesus Christ. Which in his times he shall show who is the blessed and only potentate, the King of kings and Lord of lords, who only hath immortality dwelling in the light, which no man can approach unto. You see, he is the potentate of time. And it's his time. His times. His times. He controls it. And if you don't think so, turn over to Joshua. I'm not sure which one of, of us actually had this particular uh, portion in Joshua when we when we studied the book, but let's turn over to chapter ten. Verse twelve. Then spoke Joshua to the Lord in the day when the Lord delivered up the Amorites before the children of Israel, and he said in the sight of Israel, Sun, stand thou still upon Gibeon, and thou moon in the valley of Aajalon. And the sun stood still, and the moon stayed until the people had avenged themselves upon their enemies. Is not this written in the book of Jasher? So the sun stood still in the midst of heaven and hastened not to go down about a whole day. And there was no day like unto that before it or after it, that the Lord hearkened unto the voice of a man, for the Lord fought for Israel. You don't think he doesn't control time? He stopped the sun in its tracks. And the sun didn't move, move, nor did the moon. He controls time. He controls time. He's an autocratic ruler, a sovereign God who created the universe. And when he created the universe, he created space and mass and 
time. He's not controlled by time because he exists outside of time. He created time. It's something really to think about. And, and let me say this. And you've heard me talk about this subject before, and you're saying, why are you, why are you doing that? Why are you spending time here? And it's this. I truly believe that we can't have the appreciation of the plan, the total plan of God, if we don't understand that God is sovereign in it all, that he controls all events in all of time. And the marvelous thing is, he still gives man a free will within it. Now, figure that one out. Let's look at Revelation chapter 1 and verse 8. And here we'll see that God is the potentate of time. And we'll need to compare this with other verses in Revelation. Let's look at verse 8 of chapter 1. This is the Lord Jesus Christ, as I am the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the ending, saith the Lord, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. Verse 10. I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day, and I heard behind me a great voice as of a trumpet, saying, I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last, and what thou seest, write in a book, and send it unto the seven churches which are in Asia, unto Ephesus, unto Smyrna, unto Pergamum, unto Thyatira, unto Sardis, unto Philadelphia, and unto Laodicea. And let's see. 19, verse 19. Write these things which thou hast seen, and the things which are, and the things which shall be hereafter. Let me repeat that. Write the things which thou hast seen, that's what? Past tense. And the things which are, that is, present tense, and the things which shall be hereafter, that's future tense, past, present, future. Now, turn over to chapter 21 and verse 5 to 6. And he said unto me, it is done get it? It is done. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give unto him that is a thirst of the fountain of the water of life freely, and he that overcometh shall inherit all things. I will be his God, and he shall be my son. My son. Now note in 21 verse 6 that the Lord says these things that John was to write were what? It is done. What was he to write? Past, it was done. Present, although it was ongoing, it was done. Future, it was done. Do you get it? It was done. Now, there are three times when Christ says it is finished or it is done in the Scripture. The first time is in John chapter 19 and verse 30. And that is the Greek word to telestai. <coughs> and that word means that it is complete. It's finished. The other two times is the Greek word genomahi. And it means brought to pass. Brought to pass. The things past have been brought to past. The things that are ongoing have been, in God's mind, brought, brought to, to past. past. The things which are future, in God's mind, are brought to past. In other words, God is saying, to me, it's all the same. It's all the same. I exist outside of time. It's all brought to past. Stick with me. 
in the mind of Christ as eternal God, without beginning and without end, the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, all things have been brought to pass, past, present, future, for he exists outside of time and is not constrained by time. He created time. He is the potentate of time. So what does that mean? In the plan of God, what does that mean? Well, here comes the rest of the story, as Paul Harvey used to say. In Psalm 90, verses 1 to 4 and 7 to 12, we saw that God, who is the potentate of time, Moses really makes that pretty plain, doesn't he? God, in, in his wrath, in verses 7 through 12, could have simply wiped out mankind. That's what Moses is saying. He could have just wiped them out. Because if we understand that God is the potentate of time, then we understand that God is the God of power and of might. If we understand that God is the potentate of time, we understand the power of God who has complete control over us. And he reminds us that he could snuff us out like that. But you know what? When we read back in John 13, 1, we're also reminded that that same potentate of time when his hour was come. What does it go on to say? He loved his own unto the end. I like that phrase. That's how it's expressed in the, in the old King James, and I kind of like it. He loved his own unto the end. But it's the Greek word telos, the end. And it means he loved them continually and infinitely. Not just to the end of his earthly ministry. That's not what that means. For we know he loves us beyond his earthly ministry. He loves us as he stands interceding for us, as we're going to see in a minute. But it means he loves us he loves us infinitely and continually without stopping. If we look at the disciples' past three years as we come to John chapter 13, they were just like us. And for the most part, that means pretty miserable at our jobs as the servants of the Lord Jesus. Pretty miserable. Did it stop him from loving them? No, he loved them Continually and infinitely. When he stepped out of glory and stepped into his own creation and stepped into time and took on himself our sin on the cross of Calvary as he hung there, he loved us continually and infinitely. My, oh my, the power of God. He loved us to the end. Weist expresses it this way. He says, he loved them to the uttermost. To the uttermost. Secondly, when we see him as the potentate of time, we see the punishment of God. In Matthew's gospel, let's turn there. It's worth reading, even though you all know it so well. Matthew's Gospel, chapter 27. And verse 45. As the Lord Jesus hung there on the cross of Calvary, it says, Now from the sixth hour there was darkness over all the land unto the ninth hour. And about the ninth hour Jesus cried with a loud voice, saying, Eli! Eli, lama sabachthani, that is to say, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? It wasn't an answer for which he was crying. It was for the realization that we might understand why he was crying. He hung there and was there with the knowledge that the very God and Father that he loved 
beyond our understanding, had turned his back on his son because his son had our sins placed upon him and he was paying the price. He was bearing the wrath and the judgment of God. And God didn't even want this world to know what his son was overgoing and he covered the the earth with darkness for three hours. We can only imagine. We're We're treading treading on on holy holy ground, ground, even the thicker. What all he underwent. While he bore the wrath of God in punishment for you and for me. To know that that God is the potentate of time is to know that God is the God of punishment for sin. That punishment is coming for those who refuse the person of the Lord Jesus Christ as their Savior. He paid the price. But if we refuse that price, then we bear that ourselves. I praise God that I made a decision many years ago and I trust, trust Christ to pay, my, to pay the price for my sin, to bear my punishment. And I hope that everyone who's listening to the sound of my voice, whether it's over the airwaves or here in this room, will know that for sure, that they put their full faith and trust in Him. Thirdly, when we see Him as potentate of time, we see the plan of God. Turn over to 1 Peter, please. Another verse that I know you all are so very familiar with. 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 18. For as much as ye know that you were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver and gold from the, faint, the vain manner of life received by the tradition from your fathers, not by those things, but with the precious blood of Christ as a lamb without blemish and without spot, who verily was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you. In other words, the plan was put in place before time ever existed. But in these last times, specifically, specifically, it has been shown forth to us why Christ come, why Christ had come and what he did for us on the cross. Fourthly, when we see him as the potentate of time, we see the passion of God. Turn over to Romans chapter 3. Romans chapter 3 and verse 23. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins, sins that are past through the forbearance of God, to declare, I say, at this time time his righteousness that he might be just and the justifier of him who believeth in Jesus. He's both just and the justifier. When? At this time. At this time. God's passionate about it. He's a holy, righteous God who must judge sin because as we've already learned, he's the God of punishment. He has to punish sin. He doesn't have a choice. It would violate his very nature if he did not. And he had to punish sin. But instead of punishing us, instead of making us pay the price of eternal condemnation, separated from God forever, instead he put all the sin of all the world for all time on his precious, holy, spotless son who was without sin who was without blemish and without spot, and he judged our sin there on that perfect one that we might be free. It's a passion of God. A passion of God. And when we see him as the potentate of time, we see the price paid by God 
First Timothy, please, chapter 2. First Timothy, chapter 2, and verse 5. For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man, Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. In due time. To understand that he is the potentate of time is to understand the ransom that was paid, to understand the price that was paid by God to redeem us. It was heaven's best. It was the only price that would ever satisfy that holy, righteous God who had a passion for holiness and righteousness and justice. When we see him as the potentate of time in Isaiah chapter 48, we see the prudence of God. Isaiah chapter 48 verse 16 says, Come near unto me, hear this. I have not spoken in secret from the beginning. From the time that it was, there am I. And now the Lord God in his spirit has sent me. Who's speaking? Is it the prophet? Was the, had the prophet been there since time began, since the beginning? Who was there? It was the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. And he's speaking here. He says, come near unto me, hear this. I have not spoken in secret from the beginning, from the time that it was, there am I. And now the Lord God and his spirit has sent me. Thus saith the Lord, thy Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel, I am the Lord thy God who teacheth thee to profit, who leadeth thee by the way that thou shouldst go. The prudence of God. He knows the beginning from the end, and thus he knows the way that we should go. He knows the ways which will be successful for us and desires to lead us in such a way that will be for our good and God's glory. Even as Moses said, when it's affliction, even when it's, we're suffering under evil, God says, it's for your good and for my glory, and it has been planned since when? Since the beginning. I am the potentate of time. And I am a prudent God. Therefore, we should follow him, shouldn't we? No matter what, we should follow him. And when we see him as the potentate of time, we see the paraclete of God. Hebrews chapter 4, another verse that you all know so well. Beginning there in verse 14 in Hebrews 4. Seeing then that we have a great high priest that is passed into the heavens, Jesus the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession. For we have not an high priest who cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly into the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in the time, in the what? In the time of need. Some commentators will say what that really means, that we will receive that grace, that mercy, in the nick of time. In the nick of time. He's our paraclete. He's our advocate. He's the one that comes alongside us. He is Jesus Christ, the righteous, our great high priest. And he's there at the right time. Amen. At the right time. Never deserts us. Never forsakes us. He's there at the right time. At the right hand of God interceding for you and for me. He's the paraclete of God, the potentate of time. And when we see him, that the potentate of time is the parenthood of God. That's what we see when we see the potentate of time. Turn back to Galatians chapter 4. Galatians chapter 4. 
verse 6. Well, let's go back to verse 4. When the fullness of what? When the fullness of time was come, God sent forth his son, made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem them who were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. And because you are sons, God has sent forth his spirit, the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Therefore thou art no more a servant, but a son. And if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. Can you believe it? When we see him as the potentate of time, we see the parenthood of God. Behold what manner of love, John, John, John says in his epistle. Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us that we might be called the sons of God. The potentate of time. When the fullness of time was come. And when we see him as the potentate of time, we see the patience of God. Let's turn over to 2 Peter. 2 Peter chapter 3. This second epistle, Beloved, I now write unto you, and both which I stir up your pure minds by way of remembrance, that ye may be mindful of the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets and of the commandments of us, the apostles of the Lord, Lord and Savior. Knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffer, walking after their own lust, and saying, Where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. And there's a lot of people who mock his coming. They don't believe it's going to happen. But the Lord says, Don't worry about that. Don't worry about that. Verse 9, the Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. He's the potentate of time. And in the fullness of his time, he will come. Amen? He will come. He has patience. You know... This past week, once again in the Mideast, we have a crisis. It's not an unusual thing. There have been many crises in the Mideast. But the question is, what will be the result of this one? We don't know. The potentate of time knows. Potentate of time knows. I know this much. Iran has promised retaliation to the United States and to... Israel and Israel. Could this lead us to the war of Gog and Magog that we read about in Ezekiel 38, 39? Maybe. Some scholars believe that that will occur before the tribulation period. Others believe that it's the second seal of the tribulation period. But it could be. Does that mean that the rapture could happen as a result of this that the Lord was going to snatch us away beloved he could take us right now I would pray that he takes us before I finish this sermon <laughs> it might be a long time <laughs> but we don't know do we we don't know you know the first seal in, in Revelation chapter 6 is the, is the unveiling if you will of the antichrist is that what this is is precipitating we'll go before then as believers but nevertheless that could be the result of this particular action we really don't know and you say well we don't see the antichrist well, let me tell you something satan has had his antichrist in since the beginning of history he's had somebody in the wings waiting he doesn't even know when it's going to happen. How do I know that? Because the Lord Jesus Christ said that only the Father in heaven knew. And he's always had one waiting. We can look down through history. We could see that in ages past there was Nimrod, Satan's agent, 
precursor to the Antichrist. He was waiting. There was Antichus Epiphanes. He was there waiting. There was Nero. He was there waiting. There was Hitler. He was there waiting. And through Hitler in World War II, Satan tried to destroy the Jews. But the potentate of time used that to establish the Jewish nation. To call them home and to establish in what Satan had in mind. And what God, God used it for was two entirely different things because God is the potentate of time. So we don't know. What's the message? Use our time wisely because we don't know. John 13, 1 says Jesus knew that his time had come. The truth of the matter is we don't know. But God, when we see him as the potentate in time, we see him as a God who petitions us. Petitions us? Absolutely. Can you believe it? Turn over to Revelation chapter 22, beginning at verse 10. And he saith unto me, that's unto John, and he saith unto me, seal not the words of the prophecy of this book, for the time is at hand. Verse 17, and the spirit and the bride say, come. And let him that is heareth say, come. And let him that is a thirst, come. And whosoever will, let him take the water of life freely. God is a God of petition. And what's he saying? What is his petition? Come. Come. Come unto me. Come. Come all ye that are heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. Come. Come. The potentate of time is not willing that any should perish. He's saying, come. Come unto me. So while God is the potentate of time, and therefore not constrained by time, we are. Can I repeat that? While God is the potentate of time and not constrained by time, we are, and we must pay attention to time and not waste time. If I said that I had a bank account that I was opening up, one account for each and every one of you, and placed and deposited in that account $1,440 every day, but you must completely use it every day, <coughs> anything remaining will be lost, what would you do? Well, I would hope you would use it, that it wouldn't be lost. Of course, you would make sure that you spend it all. And so it is with our lives. We are given 1,440 minutes every day. And likewise, you must spend it. But I would say unto you, you must spend it wisely. Wisely. 1 Corinthians chapter 7 says, But this I say, brethren, the time is short. It remaineth that both they that have wives be as though they had none, and they that weep as though they wept not, and they that rejoice as though they rejoice not, and they that buy as though they possessed not, and they that use this world as not misusing it, for the fashion of this world passes away. In other words, don't spend your time on earthly things. Because it will all pass away. Spend it on what? Eternal things. For there is a God, the potentate of time, that we must serve. Colossians chapter 4. Walk in wisdom toward them that are without, redeeming the time. Let your speech be always with grace, seasoned with salt, that you may know how to give answer to every man. I'm past time. That's okay. Because I'm still going to give you this illustration. I think it's worth the time.
there was a young man whose sister had been condemned to death to hang in the West for a crime that she had committed. And this young man was torn to think that the sister that he loved was going to hang, dangle at the end of a hangman's rope. And so he drove, he drove, he rode across the territory and got to the governor and convinced the governor to sign a stay of execution. And he gets back on his horse and he rides as hard as he can, but the trouble was he rode so hard that he killed his horse. And so he finally makes purchase of another horse and he goes on. And it begins to rain and to storm. And one of the streams that he was required to pass became unpassable. It had taken out the only crossing and he had to wait. And finally the waters receded and he goes on thinking, I still have time, I still have time, I still have time. And he got on for such a good ways, and finally he was so exhausted, he thought, I I can stop and I can rest for just a few minutes. I still have time. And he stopped, he laid down, he fell asleep. And instead of a few minutes, a few hours had passed by the time he woke up. And he gets back on his horse, and he rides, and he rides, and he rides, and he rides. And finally, he, goes, he rides right into the main street into the town where the hanging was to take place. And sure enough, there were the gallows, and he could see. And he rides just as hard as he can. But just as he approaches the gallows, with the stay of execution in his hand, the hangman released the trap door. Just in time for him to see his sister dangle at the end of the hangman's noose. We may think we have time, but we need to be sure we don't waste it. Who knows what soul may fail to hear the gospel because we fall asleep And the hangman's noose throughout all the eternity is what they will bear. A death, a condemnation, a separation from God because we have not redeemed the time even though the days we know are evil. I leave you with this question. It's written in Revelation 22, 20. He that testifieth these things say, Surely I come quickly. Amen. That's the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. Can we truthfully answer with the Apostle John, the Alpha and the Omega statement, Even so come, Lord Jesus. Amen. May we all bless and praise and serve the potentate of time in the year 2020.